Hello, hello. <clears throat> this is uh, uh, the great Johanna speaking. I'm doing a sort of a live stream. I have some topics prepared now this time because uh, last time I noticed someone complained that why do I always just uh, respond to the commenters? That's not my intention. I usually do like proper podcasts and often for my live streams, I will also have uh, uh, topics uh, at hand. Um, today, I'm going to talk about uh, the situation in the UK as an introduction, but then I'll move on to uh, some more deeper stuff about what's going on in our society, okay? So if you feel like, you know, leaving comments, I will, res I will interact with you uh, along the way there. So about what happened in the United Kingdom for the past week or so, thousands and thousands of people, patriots, have been thrown in jail by Keir Starmer's Stasi police forces. It really is starting to look like Eastern Germany or worse. It's like Russia or North Korea even, where you can get arrested, you can, you can go to jail for posting the wrong or retweeting or reposting something that you found on Facebook. Liking the wrong meme can get you 20 months in jail. It's absolutely preposterous. But what is it really? What does it really mean? Well, very clearly, it's a class warfare. Keir Starmer, I assume, is a multimillionaire, just like Rishi Sunak before him, just like most of your uh, Boris Johnson. You know, I'm from the Netherlands, so I'm, I've taken a bit of an interest in UK politics, right? And the problem with uh, the UK is you are ruled by a sort of high class elite, even if they call themselves Labour, right? So it doesn't matter if you vote for Labour or for the Conservatives because they're all rich people representing upper class interests at the expense of the people. And so they've started beating down the white working classes. But why? Why are they? Why is the BBC, for example, promoting uh, some kind of an imam who thinks it's okay to beat your wife? So wife beating Muslims are fine. They get the approval rating of, they get the approval stamp of, uh, of the BBC and, uh, and your mainstream media. But saying something bad about Muslims, that gets you in jail for three months or, or, or three years even. That's quite absurd, right? So it's class warfare, what we are witnessing in the United uh, Kingdom. Basically, in the 1990s is when it started, where um, sort of the more fearful white kids in high school, they were afraid of what brown people thought of them, and they started calling other white kids racist. That's how it all began. And that clique of white kids, from, and they started calling other white kids racist. That's how it all began. And that clique of white kids, from to start projecting power, and I'm going to talk a bit more about that later in the show. Uh, for those of you joining, I just got started. I plan to speak for about an hour or so. I've got something prepared that I want to go through. So I was just talking about what's happening in the United Kingdom and what that really means. Um, you know, leftism, political leftism that we experience in our, all our Western European nations is a form of appeasement, right? These are people who worry more about what their former colonies and their former enemies now think of them, now that the wars are over and things have settled a bit in, in this globalist system. And they're so worried about it that they are willing to crack down on their own more right-wing um, people there, let's say the working classes. Um, and here I think something really goes wrong because um, if it's just appeasement politics, then obviously that's a very weak position. But the real problem here is that the working class white people in Europe are descendants of the feudal serfs, right? Europe had uh, feudal serfdom from 800 AD to around 1800 AD for almost a thousand years. So it started way before the first black slaves were ever caught by, by Europeans, right? And in many cases, feudal serfdom was uh, abolished after uh, slavery was properly abolished. Uh, and so I think, I believe in the 1860s, you still had serfs living in Germany, white people, meaning uh, a serf, the difference between a serf and a slave is very, very minimal. A, a serf basically was appointed a, a plot where you had to live. You worked for your owner, the feudal lord. You didn't have the right to own private property. You had to basically um, 
when you died, your family only inherited half of what you of your personal possessions, your personal items, and the other half went to your uh, your owner. Basically, uh, you did unpaid work. Uh, basically, it's like slavery, but without the chains. But definitely with the sort of punishments that go with uh, go with slavery, right? And so our people, our working class people in Europe, who have been oppressed for at least the past 1,000 years or so by this overclass, the feudal overclass. You see, it's the European upper middle to upper class who did colonialism, who profited most off of the uh, mercantilist trade around the world, who are now profiting most off of globalism. It's this class, the Keir Starmer class or the Boris Johnson class, right? And if we're talking about the UK, they did colonialism, but they're now basically throwing their working classes under the bus for it. It's, so it's clearly a, it's a class warfare caused by this white elite's concern for public relations. Like they don't want brown people or black people to hate them too much. And so they crack down on primarily free speech, which is very interesting because for us white people, Words are just words, at least in my, in, my, in my opinion. Words are just words. But then what happens when, when you say something mean about Muslims, they freak the fuck out, right? I read, I read an article where in France, a Muslim family had bought a bacon cake from a French baker. They bought it. And then, of course, they found out it was bacon and that bacon is pork. And they came back to torch the bakery. Now, that is a level of insanity that we do not comprehend in the Western world. If I buy a cake from a Muslim store and it is, I don't know, halal, and I didn't know it was halal, I'm not going to go back and torch their place. That's absurd. Why would you do that? Now, apparently, we are importing people who have a very different psychology from our own, right? They are so strange. In some way, they, they are extremely sensitive to things like words, like you're not allowed to insult them or something. This is the end of the world to them. They lose face or something, right? Whereas for us in the Western world, that's just part of day-to-day -day business. You just suck it up, right? Like, I can't believe the number of times nasty people have called me nasty things in the comment sections. You know, you just, you grow over it. You, you grow a thicker skin, basically, and then you just deal with that. It's very different for these uh, inflammable peoples who basically one or two words are enough to set them on fire. Right, so... Briefly then, so why then, why are the European overclasses, the upper classes, why are they in bed now with the Indian people, with the Africans, Central Africans, Sub-Saharan Africans, because North Africa is basically Islamic anyway, but then also with Muslims and so on, uh, Pakistani Muslims, but not Iranian Muslims. Iranian Muslims are bad. So you see how arbitrary it all is. The Western world is at war with China, with Russia, and with the Muslims of Iran, but we love the Muslims of Saudi Arabia and of Pakistan, and we love the Hindus and we love the, the Central Africans, right? So it's very arbitrary constellation here that is basically the, the chessboard for World War III. It doesn't make much sense if, you, it's because these, like I said, these European elites, they worry way more about how the world perceives them or what they intend to achieve on the global chessboard, and they don't care that much at all about their own people, their own people's languages and cultures, our own, our own inner convictions, our own outlook of life. It doesn't concern them that much. It, it's basically considered a burden or so. They would sell our culture off. They will destroy Christianity, sell our churches to Muslim investors. Basically, everything's for sale. We're, we're selling ourselves out for what? For the temporary illusion of loyalty that maybe one day the uh, the Indians and the, and the Arabs will side with us against what? Against Russia and China? I don't think so. I think what's going to happen is, is that the Western elites are going to lose their heads. They bet on the Islamic horse, or rather the, they bet on the Islamic camel. It's, it's the end. Basically, this is so stupid. What we should have done, of course, all along was develop our own inner strengths find out what are our internal validations, things that we can thrive on even if the whole world hates us. Who cares if they call us racist? Who cares if they call us colonials? We should wear those things as badges of pride. We conquered the world, after all. Why should we be ashamed of it? You know, it doesn't make much sense. 
Um, hold on, hold on. And then, so, so that was my introduction about what's going on in the United Kingdom. And I'm going to move on to um, do a little intermezzo. Hold on. And so recently, if you've been involved in the news a little bit, you may have noticed something, right? Is that uh, you have guys like Andrew Tate, Dan Bilzerian. Do you know who that is? Or even Kim.com. They are all kind of like calling out the Zionists which is good. I support them calling out the Zionists. The problem with Tate and so on is that they are supported by the Islamists. And I am not going to fight the Zionists so I can then live with the, with the Muslims in Europe. No, I'm not going to fight uh, the other way around either. I'm not going to fight the Muslims so I can then uh, be ruled by feudal Jewish overlords either. There is a sincere lack of a pro-European point of view in this world, right? Where are the genuine, authentic, pro-European voices that don't feel any need to side with uh, Zionism against Islamism or with Islamism against Zionism? Why can't we be Europeans siding with each other against the world, against the times, against the gods? Okay? Why can't we uh, fight together and basically crack down, right? Crack down on the insanity in the world, on, on all these other cultures and other people who've got nothing to offer us, basically. Certainly not on the inner side, right? Exactly, like someone mentioned, like Geert Wilders from the Netherlands, also a Zionist. Tommy Robinson, I think, is controlled opposition. He's a Zionist. You know, it's funny that they call each other out. Andrew Tate called Tommy Robinson a Zionist, but of course, Andrew Tate converted to Islam, so he's probably backed by Iran or something. He's like a Muslim, uh, Muslim spy or something. I find the whole worldview of Andrew Tate absolutely disgusting, but I also don't want to side with the Zionists in this respect. The way that the, the Zionists and the Muslim, basically Arabs and Jews, have hijacked the political discourse in Europe, in the Western world, is, well, laudable that they're so good at it, but it's also sad to see our people, our Celtic, Germanic peoples and so on, all right, and whatever you got, your Anglo-Saxons and so on. Why are we constantly debating each other about who, whose party we should support? Should we support uh, uh, Israel against Gaza or should we support the Palestinians against Israel? If these people who call me a goyim and an infidel would just kill each other off, I'd be fine with it. It doesn't concern me, not that much. I understand now the global uh, implications as well, though. Israel, geographically, is a sort of linchpin for globalist trade. But then again, there are, al there are alternatives that I've spoken about before. For example, you can uh, start trading along the Northern Sea Route, but that would imply you have to work with Russia. Or you could just blow up globalism altogether and see what happens next, right? We don't have to go along with the globalist experiment. I think the biggest power move Europe could make is to become strategically independent, which to me means we decide who to deal with and what to deal with them for. So we can deal with Russia and we can deal with the US, we can deal with um, the Muslim world, or we, but always on our own terms and always to achieve things that we want. And if we can't get what we want, we'll deal with someone else. We'll get a better deal somewhere else, right? Um, this, this, however, requires Europe to become masculine again. Today, we have a very feminine Europe. I mean, politically speaking, our leadership are very mentally feminine people. This has nothing to do with muscle, but with in here, right? How masculine are you in your mind? And we are pursuing appeasement politics. We're trying to make everybody feel welcome, warm, included. That's where inclusion comes from, right? The inclusion politics. Uh, everybody has to be treated equally. That's the way you treat children. You treat children equally. Men don't treat each other equally. Men realize you have your allies, right? That you fight with for values and principles that you share or, or shared outcomes. And that's it. Everybody, everybody else is basically a potential enemy, right? Someone said it today, uh, friendship is for children. And probably that is true. Friendship is for children and for women. Men don't have friends. Men have allies that we go to war with because we share a certain outcome or desire to win, right? 
uh, and that means we, are, we have to exclude a lot of people. Exclusion is actually very natural and normal. What are we doing? Trying to include the whole world into our system to win what? Like I said, temporary loyalty from the Hindus and the Muslims to help us fight Russia and China. If we have to do that, if like in the UK, you've imported like 20 million migrants in the past 20 years, or was it 10 million? Uh, too many. You're murdering your own people. You're jailing your own people for speaking out because your globalist sensitivities are so extreme that you, you can't allow ordinary people to have an opinion about what is basically destroying their own, des destroying their own way of life, right? right? And then, you know, it needs to come to an end. Like I said, we need an unapologetic pro-European voice. And I'm just one guy trying to voice this. All right, let's see how far I can get. I hope I can get uh, more traction, of course. I hope I can get more people supporting or realizing if I could only wake people up and get them to realize this like look you don't have to side with Palestine or with Israel or with Andrew Tate or with Tommy Robinson why don't we start with ourselves why don't we start with us Europeans fighting for what matters to us for our so to express our own internal validations and what might those be well we are a race of warriors so let's act like it Right. Uh, if you split the Olympic medals of the 2024 Paris Olympics by race, then white people won most medals. So we are an extremely athletically talented people. Why don't we uh, stop being ashamed of who we really are and who we might really be? Um, so I want to move on. Uh, I'm going to talk more. I'm going to respond more to your comments because I see a lot of people commenting and that's great, you know. Uh, I'm going to go through some more that I want to discuss for my podcast here because I'm going to upload this later to, to my own website, uh, jmk.info and also to my YouTube at uh, The Great Johannes. That's my YouTube handle. Uh, and I have a Rumble channel nowadays. I think it's the username is JohannesMK on Rumble. I think, uh, let me check. Uh, oh, no, I can't check it now. Uh, yeah, is Europe really everyone's continent? Yeah, it shouldn't be. It's not everybody's continent, it's ours. And I don't care about what you say about history, about the Yamnaya or something. It's ours now, so it's ours. All right. They want Europe to become like South America with the call to prayer included, all right. But in South America, there is a clear division of the races. Basically, the, the, the minority of white people or white looking people are in charge of places like brazil right even in mexico the elites are basically mostly european even though the population is like 80 percent native genetically the leadership is 80 percent european so that's my point i was going to mention this uh, i don't know if i have time for it but i was going to mention that uh one possible solution to the mass migration of say indian and arab people into europe is of course the reinvention of a caste system. Now, you see, this is interesting. The liberal leftists, when they speak of multiculturalism, what do they mean? They mean kebab, right? And they mean, uh, you know, foreign exotic foods coming together so we can eat and, and listen to foreign music and so on. But what if multiculturalism is really going to mean this? European feudalism fused with an Indian caste system which would make Europe, Europe society, the harshest, most totalitarian, fascistic society ever imagined in human history. Imagine that if a fusion of European feudalism with an Indian caste system, of course, putting the Indian people below the Europeans and the Europeans being the feudal lords ruling over the whole thing. You know, nobody thinks of it that way, but that is also multiculturalism because you've got two pieces of a culture of two different cultures fused together into something absolutely <laughs> evil but good for us so that just goes to show how about how i think about things you know uh nobody's ever bullied me they wouldn't dare because i'm bigger <laughs> so let's go on to uh, our our response our reaction if i uh, if i speak about uh uh like, I was thinking of a name for our movement. 
And I think the movement will be called uh, the reaction because I'm basically a, a nationalist reactionary who wants to beat back progress. And if, if necessary, we'll just bomb the world back to the Bronze Age, right? Um, right. Yeah, Europe is not a savannah. <laughs> Time to evolve. Well said. Um, so there are two books I would recommend you to understand the enemy's point of view because they were written by the enemy. The one is Practical Idealism, published in 1925 by the famous Richard von Kaudenhove Kalergi. He was like a half Japanese, half Austrian European nobleman. And his book was very, very uh, well read, very famous among the European elites, the European nobility. The premise of practical idealism is simply this. Up until the 19th century, Europe was ruled by a sort of Germanic Celtic warrior caste. And that has been replaced with an urban educational, I'm sorry, an urban educational elite, basically urban Jews took over and they started transforming us through their media and education, right? The other book about, about, about this book, about practical idealism, I did a whole ep uh, episode about it already. You can find it on Rumble. I'll, I'll mention the title. The title is The Kalergi Plan Confirmed. It was episode number 66 of the Johannes Tyrannus podcast on Rumble. Subtitle was YT Genocide is EU Policy. So you might go to, if you might find, uh, if you might find my own Rumble channel, which is, uh, oh, my username on Rumble is The Great Johannes. You might find the episode there. It was episode number 66. And so I already did the whole video about the Kalergi plan. That was like two years ago where I went into that. And uh, some woman, Victoria Elms from Sky News from the UK, she actually found that video and used it in a sort of scaremongering uh, little uh, advertorial advertisement. Uh, she did a little research into my speeches and she called me like, what was it, like uh, <laughs> a dangerous neo-Nazi anti-Semite or something. Uh, it was a bit laughable, but uh, it just goes to show that uh, mainstream media are absolutely terrified of of people who actually read the books. I, I, I read Practical Idealism by Kaudenhove Kalergi, the Kalergi plan master. And I just quoted from the book and they literally tell you that, yeah, Jews, urban Jews took over the culture of Europe around the early 20th century, late 19th century, uh, after the, the Marxist revolution of 1850 or so, 1848, right? And then uh, our Germanic, Celtic, Anglo-Saxon uh, warrior, elite, a warrior aristocracy was deposed. That's what happened. So there's not much you can do about that. It seems to be just the truth. Okay, but the other book I wanted to talk about now is The Protocols of Zion, which have been called a forgery. But if you read it, and I've recently reread it in German, uh, the, the program is exactly what is happening today. This was also noticed by Kim.com. Do you know who Kim.com is from the uh, mega upload uh, drama? He lives in New Zealand and he's under arrest or something. They're going to extradite him to the USA. So Kim.com also uh, posted this to his like millions of followers. Like 4 million people saw his tweet where he goes over these excerpts from the book, The Protocols of Zion by the learned elders of Zion. Um, the book is a plan for the complete and total Mm, eradication of European culture, of Christian culture, and they de detail how they do it, meaning they make media, for example, the linchpin, right? Uh, the Dark Ages were dark. That's another forgery of our history. And so I want to go over that a little bit. Um, so my, my imagination is this. There, there's a lot going wrong in the Western world. Mass immigration is obviously a gigantic problem. Our cities are being wiped out. Uh, London is like 37% white British. It should be 95% or 97%, right? It's happening to all the cities in the Western world. <clears throat> we, are, we are losing out in the cities, but then again, I don't feel so sorry about that, yeah? I don't feel very sorry about losing Paris and London. These places, in my view, can just burn up. I don't care. The point is that we preserve our people and we don't, we don't say we're going to defend the cities 
and then maybe we'll save our people. No, 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 we're going to save our people. And if we have to sacrifice the cities, then we'll do that. So the attitude should be very different. The attitude is self-preservation. We're going to save ourselves. We're going to not just survive, but thrive in the future. By the end of the century, white people in Europe will be absolutely thriving people. Right? We will be strong and healthy mentally and culturally and physically. In many respects, we will be booming and growing, and the world will have to fear us again, as they always did. Right? I mean, there's a reason why they call us the white supremacy, and we never call them the brown supremacy. Have you ever heard anybody speak of the black supremacy? Nobody does that. There's a reason for it. So we escape diversity in the end by moving up. Imagine it this way. If diversity were like a, a glass, a mixed drink, with, and you mix it up, but then you put it down, and after a while, the liquids settle, and in some cases, they return to their different layers. We are the upper layer of diversity. When, when the chaos has settled, we revert to being on top, as it should be. So I call this the ascent. I call it... Um, Basically, our, 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 my strategy would be uh, to side with the working classes, with, with proper middle class leadership siding with the working classes. Uh, we're going to be reactionaries and nationalists, caring for our own people, our own interests, our own internal motivations, internal validations. We're going to project power again, have our own no-go zones. You know what a no-go zone is, right? Well, like in Sweden, there's areas where as a white person, you go there, they beat you up. We're going to have our own no-go zones. If, I, if diversity comes there, diversity will be beaten up, right? We're going to turn the tables. They have Islamophobia laws, we get Christophobia laws. They have anti-Semitism laws, we have anti-Caucasian laws, right? So we get arrested for, for posting something on Facebook, they get arrested for posting something on Facebook, and so on and so forth. We're going to play this game eye for an eye. That's our basic, our fundamental strategy, eye for an eye. Mano a mano, right? Whatever they do to us, we will do to them, but maybe 10 times, right? What they do to us, we do to them 10 times to teach them. And then we support a culture, a reactionary culture. Reactionary means we beat back the LGBT. We beat back a lot of this progressive nonsense. We do, we, uh, we do away with it. We put, we put an end to it, right? And then uh, what we want to achieve is to ascend meaning to put ourselves on top of the European culture, European society again. Even if we can't wipe out the diversity, we will still be, we will be the feudal lords of that hard European feudalistic caste system, right, that we are going to create. So, uh, now I wanted to go through, go over some of these excerpts from the Protocols of Zion, to, uh, to discuss them a little bit and then see how we might respond because it's very easy to get depressed in your, between your ears, right? You, you read about so much going wrong in society. When I look at TikTok, Twitter X, the, especially Twitter X is very, very depressing, very negative, whereas TikTok has more fun videos, but uh, Twitter X is so negative and then you go down the spiral and you start to believe that, oh no, there's, just, there's nothing we can do. We can never save our people anymore. We're just, we're just going to die out. White people are going extinct. We're just going to have to learn to live with us. You know, Kamala Harris is going to be the president. We should never think like that. Snap out of it. Break out of it. This is wrong. Okay? This is totally wrong. Hold on. Here, eye for an eye. Block and report you too. So, uh, what we're going to do is... Uh, change our mind. And that's very easy to do, actually. You simply, when you read something really dis catastrophically negative, something depressing and disastrous, think of, think of the opposite. Think of what you would want it to be. So I'm going to practice that with you now a little bit. So here's a, here's a quote from uh, the Protocols of Zion. Due to our efforts, the spiritual leadership of the non-Jews was deposed in the eyes of the people and robbed of every influence. Dot, dot, dot. If they still had the people behind them, the realization of our plans would be severely hindered. So they claim that they have already done away with the leadership of, of the Christian priestly class, so to speak, or our own, I would say our own native Germanic Celtic priestly class, right? Uh, 
And okay, I need to backtrack a little bit and explain to you a little bit about why is it so important to have a priestly class. A priestly class are basically the very people or the only people in any society who really truly imagine new futures and new outcomes. It comes from them, it always has been. Kings and emperors represent authority and tradition, but they rarely introduce change. Kings want things to stay the way they are. They are traditionalists, right? Because um, that is how they hold on to power. They don't want to lose power, so they don't want that much change once they are in power. And so you have the three main castes, the classes, right? You have the priestly class, the kings who represent authority, the priestly class who represent the, the spiritual, the creative, aspect of society and then you have the warrior class who defend that society we need to rebuild all three of these we need to, if you notice those sort of people who were fighting in southport the battle of southport so, uh, in the uk where they were fighting uh, um, and then they got arrested by keir starmer and thrown in jail if you should look at their faces they look they look like actual warriors these are the sort of germanic celtic Saxon warriors who used to fight, face off with the Romans as well, right? And so everything's been done before. Everything is a repetition of past elements that are returning into the present. It's a, the eternal return, that's how, how you might call it. And so we need to rebuild a priestly class, which is an extremely exclusive select group of people who wield tremendous power through the kings and through the warriors and through the education and the media. Today it is so sadly that the mainstream media, television really, radio and television really captured our minds for the past 100 years or so since uh, the invention of cinema and, and TV and so on, color TV 1960s, 70s, right? And then the internet came and with the internet you have more dissemination of independent voices like myself i get to be on TikTok. sometimes my videos get like half a million views some some of them got a million views or more i'm not bragging i'm just showing you that one person with a cell phone can have that reach and i'm not the only one there are many like me who have this kind of reach like uh, authentic voices who do their own thinking right? I, I see myself as a member of the priestly class of course I'm here to try to generate new thoughts, new concepts for you so that they start getting picked up by society at large and that eventually one of the most important things for us to do, of course, is using the new priestly class and the newfound influence we might get through the digital systems to overthrow the traditional mainstream media. There's nothing traditional about mainstream media. They're obviously perverts, but we need to... Uh, uh, we need to diminish their power, basically do to them what they said they would do to us, right? <clears throat> like they would remove our spiritual leadership. That's what we're gonna do. We're gonna remove the spiritual leadership, which is the media. <clears throat> the media and their pop musicians, their degenerate pop musicians like Madonna or something, or you know, crap that is harming us. Uh, here's a quote about our daily bread. The worry for their daily bread forces the non-Jews to keep quiet and be our obedient servants. From among them we shall recruit the useful ones, and then I have a quote here that says, uh, to work as our journalists, basically that's what, that's what it tries to say. So they recruit from the Goyim, from our people, people who look like us, to be our media journalists, basically, or even like people like Don Lemon or something, and they lie to us, they get paid to lie. That's a sad aspect of us that, of course, among our own kind, there are always some traitors willing to work for the enemy, right? If they get paid well enough. And so most people who rise in the ranks of journalism, our own people, I'm not talking about Jewish people, but most of our own people who rise the ranks of journalism end up being absolute traitors. They betray us, you know. Uh, yeah, I, hey, I have read uh, by Spengler, uh, Prussianism and socialism. What was it called? No, Prussianism. Yeah. And uh, also Der Untergang des Abelandes at the end of the, right? Yeah, the media are absolutely disgusting. Well, welcome to the show. So I'm discussing some quotes from the Protocols of Zion and to see what we can do about it, right? So here clearly we need to find a way. This is most important. I would say it's the most crucial thing to do is to capture the mainstream media infiltrate it or stage events that they have to report on in order to confuse them 
or somehow pull the plug on them, just take down their satellites if we have to. There's a movie called The Running Man with Arnold Schwarzenegger. It was written by this uh, horror novel author. What was he called? Stephen King. The Running Man. Watch it. It's an old movie, but it's good because it's about this uh, rebellion. Uh, a bunch of rebels come together in this game show and they infiltrate uh, the resistance, basically. And they, des they destroy the satellites that broadcast these TV shows that are brainwashing people. We need to think about that. Could, could we get somehow Elon Musk to do it? Because I think Elon Musk's SpaceX companies has the potential to start shooting down satellites of the mainstream media. You need to think like that. We need to somehow, or could amateurs do it? Are amateurs able to send rockets up in space nowadays to take out the satellites, right? The ones that broadcast CNN and so on. You have to start thinking about this because we need to, uh, yeah, Stephen King is not on our side, but that movie, strangely, was a good one. It shows us what we can do. We need to destroy, the, uh, basically, the media from within. All right, and that, that uh, ties into the next one here. We shall absolutely control the media so that not a single announcement will ever reach the public without our control. In this way, we shall have a sure tri triumph over our opponents, for without the media, they are helpless. Well, the same thing applies to us. See, see what they want to do to us, we can do to them. Clearly, we need to take down the media. Here's another quote about the media. In our government, besides ourselves, there must only be the mass of enslaved people. A few billionaires devoted entirely to us, police and soldiers. To do this, we must create chaos and hostilities, and we must use all deceit, treachery, and falseness possible. Our greatest weapon is the media. Right, but so is ours. Our greatest weapon is also the media. We will simply use counter media or counter narratives on their media, things that force them to report on it, things that may confuse them. Right? If somebody from the mainstream media sticks a microphone under your face, asks you some questions, always lie to them. Always lie. Always give them false impressions, false hopes even. If you can get their hopes up, right? always pretend. Like if there's like a Muslim riot in one neighborhood, Tell them it's far-right people. And then the media will run over there to film the far-right people and they'll be confronted with the Muslims. You have to deceive them. Deceive the journalists. Do it to them. I think if we could get the ideas out there, I think it's possible, you know? You know, we could train our people to be better at responding to the journalists and not be afraid of lying to their faces, right? And, and set them off on the wrong track and so on. How else? Because we have to start somewhere. It needs to be some kind of a, a guerrilla media interaction. Like we are the guerrillas and instead of using violence, we use deception and we lie to them, right? And make them make the media believe things that aren't so. Instead of because that's what they do to us all the time. So we're going to return the favor, you know? It's something to train. It's something to, that you need to pass on to your children. But eventually, I think people are going to get it and they might actually because it's fun, you know, it, would be, it might even be fun to, to participate in that, right? Here's a quote by Friedrich Nietzsche, very different. Nietzsche wrote somewhere, we will distract the, brain, the brainless heads, oh, no, sorry, this is not by Nietzsche. This one's by Nietzsche. Asceticism and Puritanism are almost indispensable means of educating and ennobling a race which seeks to rise above his hereditary baseness and work itself upward to future supremacy. Ding, ding, dong. That's exactly what we're going to do. That's what I was talking about earlier, about our movement being called the reaction, basically nationalistic reactionaries. And our goal is the ascent, to rise above ourselves and others in the process, obviously. And we do that perhaps also by you know, becoming a little bit ascetic, meaning we're not going to eat at McDonald's anymore and a bit puritanist in the sense that if something isn't good for us, then we tell it to fuck off. If we don't want it, go away, go home, right? All right. Yeah, I, I'm seeing your comments uh, flow by. Uh, I'm going to focus a bit more on your comments in a bit because I just wanted to go through this, this part about... Uh, the Protocols of Zion, there was uh, something that interested me that I saw. Uh, well, this is here about deindustrialization, which is happening in Germany and the Netherlands, for example. We shall create an economic crisis which will stop 
dealings in all exchanges and bring industry to a standstill. We shall throw onto the streets whole mobs of workers simultaneously all over the world who will rush to loot property and delight to shed blood. Uh, that's what they're probably doing with mass immigration, right? The mass migrants coming into the UK or the Netherlands or Germany, uh, they, are, they are mercenaries. They are foreign soldiers who will fight against the native middle classes and strip the native middle classes from, uh, of all their wealth while shedding a lot of blood. That seems to be the plan. They're just, they're just following the protocols of Zion. This is simply the, the globalist plan for us. But now that we know about it, and we have known about it for a long time, how come we can't do something about it? In one way, it might be a positive thing. If the migrant mercenaries living in our countries do attack the middle classes, then finally the middle classes will also wake up. They will realize, hey, hey, we were never safe. We were, we've been conned, we've been scammed. Maybe then finally they will seek recourse with the uh, white working classes, and then you get what I hope, what I'm, what I'm trying to achieve is that alliance between the white working classes of the West with the white middle classes. Together, they are still strong enough to beat back a lot of this nonsense. And that's what we need to do. Yes, keep your shit over McDonald's. <laughs> uh, it's, it's unhealthy. I was reading quotes from the Protocols of Zion. It's a book from 1903. Uh, maybe the last quote that I want to go, go over and then I'll just go on with your, inter I'll, I'll interact more with the audience. Uh, here, I think. No, that's about it, I suppose. Basically, they're trying to create chaos so that people will be forced to accept their rule. But, Alternatively, we will offer a way out of their rule. <laughs> if they want to build a globalistic uh, rule-based order that enslaves all of humanity, why don't we create nations of our own again, new nations, like they do in Orania in South Africa, for example, and simply build out from there? We can do this wherever we want to, wherever we can do it. Uh, you know? Yeah, it's... This Protocols of Zion thing, yeah, it is kind of like, it's just our reality now. This is what they're doing. There's no, uh, nothing to, nothing to be confused about. It's very, very clear. So, all right. Well, let's see. I've been speaking to you for, uh, for uh, 45, 45 minutes or so. I'll go on for another 15 or so uh, talking to you. Yeah, well, I was reading the uh, Protocols of Zion. If you want to understand the enemy's plan for you, read The Protocols of Zion and also Practical Idealism. All right. Yeah, we're going to have to unite. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, what's going, what's going to happen to Ireland? Yeah. Countries like Ireland, England, France, Germany, we're all in the same, same situation here. There's a... Uh, foul play by our own ruling classes, including the non-Jewish elites, right, who still exist, exist to some extent, they're absolutely uh, treasonous. They've betrayed us. Right? Where can we create new nations? Basically anywhere, uh, anywhere where you can uh, control the land. So you could start it in your own countryside. Otherwise, options are, for example, the sub-Arctic regions, Eastern Europe, parts of it. We're going to have to wait a little bit for uh, the war conflict with Russia to be over. But in the end, I think the West will lose World War III because it's a war, a three-front war, a four-front war against uh, Russia, China, Korea, North Korea, and uh, Iran. You can't win that kind of war. It's not going to happen. Uh, yeah, what about corruption in politics and, and uh, blackmailing? Uh, I think most politicians, honestly, are pedophiles, like the top-ranking ones. 
and that's their real bonus. That's why they'll, they'll betray their people for 150K a year or 80K a year. But their real, their real reward is access to, you know, what the Secret Service delivered to them on Friday and Saturday night, right? It's, uh, it's quite disgusting that if you think about it, but I think it's probably true. We are ruled by, we have psychopaths who control the pedophiles and the pedophiles betray their people. That's probably how it works, you know, but the psychopaths in charge, you don't see them, they don't show their faces, right? Thoughts on an American divorce, you mean like Europe cutting loose from the USA? Yeah, I think that may be necessary after the Third World War, whether we win or lose it, Europe will be left in ruins again. For us to start over means uh, cut loose from the USA in that point, yeah. But not, not necessarily from the American people. Like I often make the mistake of speaking about the USA, but you need to make the distinction between the US people, the white people who are basically fine, except for the Democrats, of course. Uh, and then you have, well, the US leadership, and that's Anthony Blinken, Victoria Newland, and these weirdos who are pursuing plans that they're not even disclosing what they are. They're not explaining to anybody what they really want to do, right? Yeah, the phoenix rises from the ashes, yeah. Uh, yeah, I have a Telegram channel at Johannes MK. Right. What I think is so sad about the USA today, Donald Trump really is embracing immigration and uh, mixed marriages and so on. It's quite sad, you know. Uh, they're capitulating. They're accepting, okay, we can't do anything about mass immigration. Let's just destroy the nation or something. Let's just profit off of it, yeah. That's the sad angle. Even, uh, I greetings from Canada, yeah. Trump is uh, better than Kamala, obviously. It's better to have the Republicans in charge than uh, the Democrats, yeah, for Europeans too. Uh, I think we are suffering the feminization of the European mind, of the Western mind, which expresses itself in the form of speech laws, hate speech laws, very erratic policing, two-tier policing, uh, one-sided journalism. It's all about keeping up appearances, maintaining an image of we are good people, we would never do anything wrong. Never, right? And um, that's, that's bad. Europeans need to embrace their shadow, their dark side. If you know something about psychology, your shadow is the part of yourself where you've put away all the bad things. And it's, it's for us, for us Europeans, that's where we have put our warrior behavior, right? Our bloodlust and so on, our need for dominance. We've put it away in our shadow of thinking these things are bad, but no. We need to reintegrate these things into ourselves and simply accept that we don't have to be good people. We can be strong people. We don't have to be uh, inclusive. We can be aggressive and so on and so forth. We don't, there's no need for us to try to look good in the eyes of our enemies. What are you doing? <laughs> you know, your enemies don't care how, uh, don't care how good you are. <laughs> they will use that to uh, basically erase you. Yeah. Oh, you found me on Telegram, great. I usually post my videos there as a backup. So you can always go to my Telegram channel at JohannesMK to find, uh, to find my, uh, my videos because my videos used to get taken down often on TikTok, so often that I didn't know what to do. I had like dozens of uh, accounts. I lost more than a dozen accounts. And eventually I maybe figured out a little bit how to talk on TikTok to avoid the algorithm Turns out TikTok uses labels like you can't say Arabs did this and that, but you can say Middle Easterners did this and that. Yeah, it's a bit weird. It depends on the labels you use, yeah. Why not trust? All right, I'm going to post this video to my, uh, my YouTube channel at The Great Johannes and also on my own Substack newsletter, jmk.info. You can subscribe there if you want to at jmk.info. You will also be able to find on my website 
my podcast and my uh, so there's links to Spotify there and my books and so on. I've written some books. You might be interested in those. I've been speaking to you for like 50 minutes. Maybe I'll keep it up for a little more if there's some interaction from the comments, right? Yeah, I'm Dutch, but I uh, I don't live in the Netherlands. Uh, I'm traveling around uh, coming year. Uh, yeah, I've been practicing the English for a long time. As a Dutch person, it is hard to get the sounds right. <laughs> English is a very mouth is a mouthful for a Dutch person there. But I seem to be pretty good at it, and it's as good as it gets. Uh, as long as people can understand well enough what I'm talking about, I'm fine, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, what I believe in is basically ethnic separation. I don't believe people should uh, be living uh, crisscross each other in, in dense urban conglomerates. No, no, no. We need to have our own land. You have to have your homeland so you can feel like you're going home. Here's my people, my culture, my language everywhere, right? That's what we want. We want. I would rather have a thousand small nations than one big empire. It's better to have a thousand nations so that you can have true diversity, psychological diversity. Afrikaans. Oh, cool. Yeah, I, I can understand Afrikaans a little bit, most of it. Uh, but you have a lot of words that we don't know, right? So that's those words would be uh, I would have to look them up but, uh, grammatically and so on. Yeah, I can figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> I think the 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 word I love the most in Afrikaans is for uh, clear maniki. Like, can we we say chameleon? Chameleon. You say uh, like coloring man, <laughs> that is so funny. Like words like that make so much sense to Dutch people. We, we sometimes use French words or English words in place, but you in Afrikaans, you have really put some effort into getting, uh, thinking of like real uh, fitting Dutch sounding words that are really funny. Hi. Yeah, a lot of people are scared to speak, but, you know, uh, I think eventually they will come for me. You know, I've said so many bad things in the past. Uh, of course, I'm going to be thrown in jail, but I see that as a rite of passage. When they find out all the things I've been saying on my, uh, uh, on my uh, YouTube and so on. <laughs> I, I'm not afraid of this. This is a rite of passage. And uh, of course, I come out of these things stronger. They're, they're messing with the wrong person. I don't think protesting works, meaning like walking up and down the street with waving your flags and shouting phrases. I think that's absolutely a waste of time. You might use the media to project a sense of being a really big movement. But of course, uh, Maybe there are other things that you can do that are way more effective, right? Leiden is a very nice city. I think that's one of the nicest cities in the Netherlands, you know. I love the canals there. It's not as busy as the Amsterdam, of course, right? All right. All right, see ya. High vibes. All right, I have to solve the puzzle to continue. Oh. It already did. That's awesome. <clears throat> Corrected my status. I don't know. No. Hold on. Yeah, in the UK, people are getting arrested for saying things like, who the fuck is Alan? You know, if that's what gets me arrested, then throw me in jail with them, because I'm going to come out of places like that stronger than before. I mean, this is, this is just how it is. This is a, fun, a funny little fact, but most, most men who become dictators have to go to jail first. They are jailed, they come out of it, and then they become <laughs> all-powerful. So it's a rite of passage, right? Who is Alan? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yes, I am. Yeah. You don't know anything about me. All right.
Yeah, they're playing the long game. Yeah. It's it's not tenable. Things are going down the drain, you know. Uh, yeah, I found my spiritual connection uh, years ago. Uh, I was hiking down the Chekcha Pass in northern Sweden. This is on the Kungsleden Trail, the King's Trail. Uh, it's a very beautiful trail through Europe's wilderness in the uh, Swedish Lapland, right? And you have to imagine you start in a forest, you walk up the hills, and then it's like for almost 10 days you're hyperborean above the tree lines, right? And there's some tiny little birch trees here and there. There's, lots, there's places with lots of snow that I didn't expect. Uh, it's so the, the the valleys you see there are so beautiful. So I, I come down this pass called the Chekcha Pass, which is the highest point. And then I sit down there and uh, it's cold, right? Two or three degrees above freezing. My socks are wet from the snow. So I, I take I sit down because the sun is out, clear blue sky. And I take off my socks to try to dry my socks a little bit and wring them out, right? And in that moment, I'm overlooking this massive valley with two mountain ridges to the left and to the right of me, huge, right? And all the way down there in a far, far distance, you see a little speck, which is a, a log cabin, a small cabin on top of a sort of flood hill, which is my destination. That's where I'm going, right? I can pitch my tent there and get some uh, heat and get some uh, tea and coffee or something. And, and as I sit there, uh, a, a, a feeling approaches me. That's how I would describe it. A feeling approaches me and it feels a little bit overwhelming. And I realize in that instant, I'm all alone here, seemingly. I've got the sun, I've got the valley. There are other hikers behind me and in front of me, like half hour behind me or so. Right? But at, in this moment, I'm by myself and it's cold. There's some water flowing past here and there. Right? And I realize that even in this barren place where thing, nothing can grow, you can't do agriculture there. You know, I can still be fine there because I felt in that moment that I was never really alone. God is on my side. Right? Uh, I needed that kind of realization. You know? My spiritual awakening. I think I was 34 years old or so then. Yeah, that was a, an important moment in my development. Yeah. From then on, I started to think, you know, uh, we can do whatever we want in this world. We have, we have the gods on our side, so to speak, right? All right, all right. Uh, I've been speaking to you for almost an hour now. That's when I usually clock off. So you can go to my Substack newsletter at jmk.info. I have my YouTube at The Great Johannes. Also on Rumble at The Great Johannes. My Telegram at JohannesMK. I know I have all these different usernames because uh, I got banned here and there and I can't use my old username anymore. TikTok, Twitter. No, on Twitter, X, I am at Johannes MKX. So. Uh, Freemasonry is, uh, is uh, something I don't really trust at this moment, but that's okay. All right. Catch you later.